have uh, Rebecca Rambach from H Bloom. I almost said HQ. Uh, H Bloom, and um, and last month you can check out the video. I was just talking to someone on the Meetup website. We had Dane Atkinson from Sumall talk about transparent compensation practices and a lot of other interesting decisions that they've made there. Um, today we're talking about cool things in talent and onboarding, and then next month we have. Is it Donald or David? David Gaston from Single Platform, who was acquired in the past six, seven months? No, three months, four months? Um, and is going to have cool things to say about uh, merging organizations and uh, that side of the people side. So without further ado, we have Joaquin and Rebecca. Thanks, guys. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for for sharing your story. Me. Oh, yeah. Thank you guys for showing up. <laughs> uh, so you work for H. Bloom. I thought a uh, good way to start would be uh, for you to tell us a little bit about H. Bloom. You can even start with the name. How'd you get the name? Yeah, the story of the name is not, we say it's not that interesting, and then we've heard it's a little bit interesting. Essentially, it goes back to why we founded a company in um, flowers as opposed to anything else. So the flower market is massive. It's a $35 billion space, um, but it's today being served by 22,000 mom and pop shops. Um, there's sort of the 1-800 flowers in the floor, telefloor and the FTD, and that's a $4 billion segment. Um, and then there's these, this massive $30 plus billion segment of the market that's served by teeny tiny mom and pop shops all across the country, 22,000 of them. Um, and so when that's the state of the market, there's 22,000 URLs related to your product that you can't have. Um, so H Bloom was available, and <laughs> we bought it. <laughs> um, we wanted something that could transcend verticals. Eventually, we're actually very soon we're going to be selling not only flowers but also things like chocolates and candles and macaroons. Um, something that had sort of a luxury feel, but a flower relation, and was available. <laughs> Great. So can you can you say a little bit about about H Bloom? And I, I would imagine for for a lot of people here like myself before I knew about H. Bloom. I thought H. Bloom, they must be a competitor to FTD or 1-800-Flowers, yeah. and it's just a very different model. Can you, can you talk about Definitely. that? Definitely. Um, so the company was founded by two ex-software sales guys who built a big software company um, from zero to 100 million in the late 90s and early aughts, um, and basically looked for a market that was disruptable. So Lots of fragmentation, really big space, um, selling an actual thing. So you know, we give you product, you give us money. I'm from digital originally, so that was a weird concept to me when I first sat down with the CEO. But that's good, the market already exists. Um, and when we looked closer at the structure <clears throat> of how that business was being done today, there's a lot of inefficiencies in floral. And that makes some sense because these people running these 22,000 mom and pop shops are artists, they're not business people. Um, and so they make art, and then they have to run the business to make the business happen afterwards. And so these businesses are not generally run super efficiently. Um, one big part of that is lots of spoilage. Inventory dies, because it's, it's sort of a race to deliver the product before it dies, because it's dying from the second it gets cut and gets shipped to you. Um, and so we applied a subscription model, simple sort of thought, I was going to say innovation, but it's not really an innovation, right? We're just selling it on a regular basis. Um, and by doing that, we lose about 2% of our inventory on a regular basis. Other flower companies lose up to 40. Um, and that saves us a ton of money, allows us to operate more in a leaner way, right? Offer better prices to our clients. Um, and so we built the business on this subscription model selling to enterprise clients. It's a long-winded way of yep. saying we're a subscription to flower company to sell to enterprise clients. Yeah, and you sell direct to the clients, right? There's no, so 1-800-Flowers, for instance, would uh, source that through a local florist. That's right. And you sell directly. Yeah, exactly. And so it allows us to do a couple of things. One is to go after these big enterprise clients who need a really high level of service, like we do 11 Madison Park. We do craft restaurant, the Sofitel Hotel. 1-800-Flowers um, can't service a company like that because they need tons of service and super specific requirements. Um, 
the other thing it allows us to do is control the quality, right? So we're A to Z, we're doing everything. We buy the flowers from Holland or Japan or Colombia. Um, we put the flowers together in our own studio with our own floral designer. And then we deliver them in an H. Bloom van. Someone wearing an H. Bloom t-shirt you know, hands them to you and says, thank you for using H. Bloom. So you don't have that kind of control when you're outsourcing to vendors. Yeah, you talk about these uh, 22,000 artists. And I find this really fascinating. This is starting to get into the people side of the business. But um, these are people who are independent. And the people that they hire are, again, uh, mostly contractors, it seems. And yeah. these are people who haven't had uh, a salaried position before. Yeah. These are people who haven't had benefits from a company before. And this model allows you to, to employ these people in a way that, that gives them a lot of security. And I thought that was amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're not the, the artisan who's the proprietor of the shop, um, oftentimes you're part-time and you're sort of hacking together a, a full-time schedule for yourself. Part of your job is actually making the flowers, but a big part of your job is going to find work all the time. Um, and so we hire these artisans, and they don't have to manage the store. They don't have to like run the register. They just come in and make flowers um, and salaried benefits like any other full-time employer. It's another way of your disrupting the industry there, which is great. Uh, you're also, um, you have something called the SEED program, which is yeah. really interesting. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I was, I was just saying to someone before we started, um, part of the way we do talent is we sort of take people in who we think have a ton of runway, are super aligned with our values and our culture, um, and give them a lot more responsibility than we probably should. And the SEED program is a really good articulation of that. So SEED stands for Startup Education and Entrepreneurial Development. We obviously decided it would be called SEED before we put the words to the acronym. We had to sort of put down the whiteboard for a couple days, um, finally figured it out. And what the SEED program does is train someone to run an H. Bloom market. Um, so the structure of our company is such that we have a physical presence with salespeople who sell directly to customers, floral designers, delivery people, a whole operation in every city that we serve. Um, and when we decided in 2011 that you know New York was growing, Washington was growing, we were going to try to stamp out a bunch of these markets really fast. Um, we thought, you know, we need people to run them. We need we need leaders. Um, we need operations managers who are leaders. And so then we thought, well, we could just go hire an operations manager. That seems, you know, wise. Someone who's got experience in operations, um, who's managed people before. But these were sort of our, our babies that we were going to start in remote locations super far away from HQ. Um, and so the idea, we had the idea to actually grow these people internally, like seedlings. Nice. Seed. Um, nice. So we thought, we can take people in and train them on our current operations and really get to know them, right? Give them mentorship from the CEO. If they've not managed people before, that's OK. We'll give them exposure to people who have managed people before. Um, and then send them away feeling good about not only that they're competent in the function that is specific to H. Bloom, right? Flowers, weird, sort of running a flower operation, but also that they're good people and they're, they're, they're going to do what's good for H. Bloom. Yeah. Um, so it's a training program where we take people with not much experience, put them through a really intense six to 12 months, and then fling them off to a foreign city to manage a business. By the way, um, I'm sitting up here uh, facilitating the conversation, but this is really j me just facilitating the conversation. You guys can all yes, chime, in. chime in, ask questions, raise your hand whenever you'd like. Uh, oh, we already have a question. What does SEED stand for again? Startup education and entrepreneurial development. So, can you talk about some of the the successes and some of the some of the learnings, the the difficult learnings that you had there? Because that's that's kind of a radical thing to take new graduates and give them, in essence, their own yeah. little startup. Yeah, and sort of one thing I didn't mention is we just like the sort of idea, the ethos of we're going to train entrepreneurs to for them to be entrepreneurs and then sort of give them a business to run. We want them to stick around, and we feel like our mandate is to grow the company fast enough that we've got opportunities that are still interesting to them after they've grown a million dollar business from nothing, which is what our Chicago market manager has done. Um, but if that's not the case, and they leave and they start their own business, like we want to invest. We just saw you build a million dollar business, 25 or something. That's amazing. I bet you can do it again. Um, so 
you know, we feel really strongly about that. And I didn't answer your question. What was your question? So I, was, <laughs> I think it's a great program. And I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about oh, the successes. The successes. You just yes, had, uh, yes, that's yes. a huge success, having Chicago built from nothing with a college grad to, to yeah. someone who's built a million dollar business in, in something they'd never done before. But then also, what are the, the difficult learnings, things that looking back, you, you, you've you changed or you, you'd rather yeah. have done in a different way? Yeah, so Zach in Chicago, if you sort of Google around for seed, he's like, there's a picture of him all over the internet standing in front of one of our vans. He's like our poster boy for successful seed grad. He, um, he went to Chicago, a city he had never been to before, um, to manage a business he had never managed before. He'd never managed anyone before. Um, and now it's at a million dollar rate plus, I think. Um, he's got a staff of like 12. They're doing awesome. Um, and that's happened three other times across the business, um, which is really exciting to see. Um, learnings, so our kind of entrepreneurship is really dirty and nitty gritty and like there's flowers and they die and they smell bad when they die. You gotta haul the dirty flower water like back to the studio and pour it out. There's all this stuff that you have to do that you know, if you're sitting in entrepreneurship class at college, they're talking about starting a business, it sounds really exciting. It doesn't sound like, that's not what I thought that was. Um, so we had two people actually um, join the program, super excited, everyone thought they were great fits, we talked to them, cultural fits, um, and then they started and just both left super early on. Mm. Which by the way, part of the process, right, is this is what it actually is. You gotta get up at 6 a.m. and haul the flower water. Um, but that was disappointing for us because these were two really high-powered, high-octane, high-potential people. Um, and we think that it was just a mismatch between what they thought or what we had articulated and what it actually was. Um, so now what we're doing is bringing folks in for a day. You gotta do the get up at 6 a.m., get to the office at 6.30, manage our fleet as it goes out the door. There's like 300 pieces of floral arrangements that are all different glass vases. You gotta strap them in like children in the back of the van, right? nitty gritty stuff. Um, we bring all the candidates in so they see that now before we make an offer. So it's not just glamour, you're giving them a, a realistic job preview. Precisely. And like the worst part, right? Like there's also managing PL, which is cool, um, and talking to our CEO and our COO, but this is your day to day. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So with entrepreneurs, obviously, it's all about the upside, you know, what you're going to build and having a huge stake in that value. When you're bringing in young people out of college with a lot of, without a lot of experience, how do you give them guarantees that the value they're going to create is going to be adequately shared with them and it's going to keep them around? That's a good question. Um, we have, basically, they're on incentive comp, um, and they get equity when they graduate to be market managers. So right two ways, one more long term, which if, I'm, if I don't have experience in startups and I've just graduated from college, I might not really understand the equity piece, but we're incentivizing them to run the market in a way that's good for H. Bloom and that's good for them. Um, and that's every month you see that. It's part of your comp. So you vest every month? So. It's cash comp, like it's like a... But the equity? Uh, yeah, equity's on our you know, vesting schedule. Yeah. What they manage towards every day is their incentive plan, which is uncapped and very clear metrics. So what other metrics do you do track for HR? Um, yeah, so for talent HR, we track a couple things. I track maniacally because I'm from digital marketing and I was like, what's the cost to acquire? I have to know the cost to acquire. I have to know the conversion rate. Um, so you know, I track those two metrics maniacally. Conversion from applicant to hire. Mm. Um, media spend per hire, and we track churn as well, which we could talk about a little bit more. <laughs> sure. Well, first, um, and, and this I just found out maybe 10 or 15 minutes ago, but can you, can you say you, you hired 52 people last year? Yeah. Which is a person a week. Um, person. And how much on media spend and recruiters and all that, how much money did you put into that? Yeah, so I track this stuff because obviously we want to get the CPA as low as possible. Um, we don't use outside recruiters, and part of that is because we think we're our own best salespeople. Um, 
we want to own the pipeline of candidates. So I've recently we've raised a couple new roles that we need to hire for, and I've just gone back into the pipeline that we own um, and surfaced people who I marked as not a great, not a good fit for anything we have now, but look awesome for later. Um, and so for those reasons, I think it's valuable for us not to use recruiters. But also we spent, you know, under we spent a couple hundred dollars per person in media spend. Um, you know, we would have spent two or three hundred times what we did per hire with a recruiter. So that's something I track very closely. Pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you were you were going to talk a little bit about churn. So yeah. I, the couple of things that I think that. Uh, Maybe I hate to get all jargony. So CPA, when she says CPA, uh, it's cost per acquisition, right? Customer acquisition. Which sounds right. really not fluffy and very sort of hard nosed. Right. How yeah. much we spent in media to hire a person? Right. So we have we have acquisition costs, and when we say churn. Um, we're, we're talking about turnover, right? How how quickly do people come into the system and leave? And and these are the same kinds of of metrics you might find if you're looking at finance or any other you know, operations position in a, in a startup. So CPA. Uh, yes, and churn. again, I, just took, I took my digital marketing spreadsheets from when I was trying to sell flowers to people for each bloom and just made them into recruiting spreadsheets. These are, these are the metrics that we use now. Um, turnover. So turnover is touchy for us. So last year, we had turnover of 36%. And when we calculated it, everyone sort of went, oh, it sounds bad. Um, so I went to. Uh, data.gov, there's a website where you can access all this awesome data from the government, including average turnover rates for different segments of businesses in the country. The average non-farm turnover in the US last year um, was 36%. And so in the year that we doubled our team from 35 to 80, we lost the same percentage of people as any other US business. And so that seems like we're doing okay. The other part of churn is we will not profess to have gotten the recruiting process precisely right yet. I feel like churn is a natural part of learning how to tweak and perfect the recruiting process. Um, so not thrilled, but you know, feel like we can make improvements based upon that to get better in the future. So what are some of the learnings? I mean, other than, it sounds like bringing them in to, to haul the nasty water. Yeah. That's a big thing. <laughs> it's real. Has anyone ever had flowers live for, like in their house for more than a week or so? It's disgusting, right? It smells really bad. <laughs> um, you use the term live loosely at that point. <laughs> right. <laughs> Start dying, continue to die for more than a week. Um, I think just tweaking the recruiting process you know, we do something like that for every role that we've hired before, that for which we've identified a task or project that will be indicative of what you need to do on the job. So we now do that across functions. We do it for product management, software engineering, um, all sorts of functions, account management. We have the account managers, can candidates go to the clients and, and sort of watch the interactions. Um, we've also started collecting structured feedback on each of our candidates. So, I know, is Carson still here? Carson's not here anymore. Um, Carson from ZocDoc gave me this awesome idea where he's got now a year of data from interviewers interviewing people. They, they rank them on the same five metrics every time. You've got a thousand row spreadsheet. You could start to predict what metrics predict success, what metrics pre predict failure, um, and which interviewers are good at making the right decisions. That's great. Yes? So do you undersell mom and pop, or do you have an Uber kind of philosophy and you oversell it? Could you talk to us about the pricing and profit margins? Yeah, so like, how do we win business? Um, our, our value proposition is often service. Um, we have sometimes the ability to undersell competition um, and win that way, but less often than you would think. Um, mostly it's, we've got this team of super engaging account executives who really care. Um, they're incentivized to care and they actually care. And they go out and find business. Um, and to that point about the way that mom and pop shops are structured, they don't often concentrate on selling. So they want to make the art. Um, 
And so for us to go in and say, we really want your business, sort of standard across a lot of other industries, not super standard in flowers. Um, and we want a lot of business that way. It also sounds like you're going after something of a different market. Right, so if I want to send my partner flowers, right now I'm probably not going to H. Bloom. Um, but if I'm, we hope that you will. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, but but if I am if I'm running the W Hotel, yeah, and I want to have beautiful flower arrangements, consistent flower floral arrangements, in my lobby every week, the best place for me to go it seems, H. Bloom. And that's our value proposition, right? The W Hotel works with a business-minded vendor for their linens, right, across all their markets. Works with a you know, big company to get their glassware to brand specifications. So that's what we are being for flowers. Yeah. And there's that consistency there. Right? You know what you're getting. You're getting an H. Bloom yeah. floral arrangement. That's right. As you start open up the market, how, how is there a playbook for this new guy that you're sending out to Chicago yeah. and, or St. Louis somewhere? And he goes, okay, what's, what do I do on day one? Kind of That's an awesome question. Um, I particularly like that you use the word playbook because a lot of my past two weeks have been spent in playbook meetings. Like on my calendar it says playbook, playbook, playbook. Um, so we're building it now. We've been growing so fast that we haven't frankly spent much time to take stock and write it down. Um, and in a business with as many moving parts as ours, it's vital, right? Like that guy needs a playbook. Um, the seeds thus far have been really self-sufficient and we tell them the whole time in the program, we don't have the playbook yet, right? You're gonna get tons of person support, um, but we don't have the book. We're taking part of 2013 to write the book um, because I think that's vastly, vastly important. What was your curriculum for the seed program? And then how much resource does your HR team have applied to it and then your executive team? How much time was in everyone's busy? Yeah. As investment. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, I mean, seed is going to always be an iterative process, right? Like now we don't, we don't have the playbook today, and so seed is one thing. Seed is, you're going to get thrown in the fire. There's some practice being in fire. Um, you know, seed will be a lot of exposure to the playbook down the line. Today, um, it's largely apprenticeship. And then we have, supple we supplement with sort of two other components. One is executive exposure. Every exec, every functional leader, right, VP of Finance, VP of Engineering, or the whole team commits to spending a dinner, a breakfast, a coffee with you um, at least once in the CEO more than once when he's in town. The point of that is more than mentorship to build a relationship because inevitably you will face a time when, you know, someone on your sales team quits and you have to be able to call me at nine at night and be like, I'm freaking out, I don't have enough sales bandwidth, right? We have a relationship with it, so you can do that. Um, the second part of the structure is H University, where at the end of last year, we started um, holding classes in three functions, operations, management, and sales. Um, and seeds attend operations and, sa and management classes, where once a month, we have a formal time for you to sit with a subject matter expert via like a video chat thing that I love. If you guys don't use Adobe Connect, you should. It's inexpensive and very cool. They have like a Brady Bunch panel thing for video and then you can share content. Um, and so we do that for seeds once a month. The rest of it is apprenticeship. And how do you track the efficacy of these training programs? Uh, we would love to better track the eff efficacy of the training programs. Um, because there's so many moving parts and so much of our business is operational, there's a ton of things that we are beginning to track. Like we build homegrown software to track things like how many how many parking tickets did you get this week and how did that affect your profit margin? Um, those pieces are sort of all coming together and sort of hopeful that not too far down the line we'll be able to track a program on you know how to park better mm -hmm. <laughs> with I have fewer parking tickets. Yeah. You, uh, can you talk a little bit about the structure of the organization? What are the different departments? How many engineers do you have versus mm -hmm. sales versus floral arrangers? Yeah. Um, so I think there's two things to think about with our, our org structure, or two things that I think about a lot with our org structure. One is 
were distributed. Um, and that's an interesting startup problem because haven't come upon too many other very high growth companies where there are really lots of tiny companies all across the country and that's purposeful and that's how we plan to continue growing for the short term. Um, and then the second part is there's a ton of execution, operations and execution. Um, perishable product, we make it ourselves. And so HQ looks sort of like a regular software development themed startup. There's like a bunch of guys coding, finance team, um, and then every market is sales and making flowers. Um, so there's a bunch, you know, there's a bunch of interesting things around that, right? Like, how do we do training geographically distributed? What's important to a software engineer is that the same as what's important to a floral designer? It turn out, turns out it's not. Um, a bunch of sort of interesting things to think about there. It seems like there'd be a lot of sharing from one. Node back to HQ. Is there a lot of sharing, not sharing, or communication going on between the cities? Yeah, um, there there is is the short answer, but I think that there's not enough. Um, we think that there's not enough. You know, the sort of what you hear around startups today is you get to be involved in everything and you know everything that's going on and sort of tons of knowledge sharing around all um, levels of the company, which I think for and the organization is distributed as we are, we're doing an awesome job, but there's still stuff that gets lost, right, from in between here and Dallas. <laughs> um, and so we're trying to actively facilitate more sharing with things like H Bloom U management, where all of the ops managers get on the Brady Bunch Skype thing with our CEO, um, and he asks, you know, when have you faced this challenge? Tell me about when it happened in Dallas. Tell me about when it happened in San Fran. Um, so we're really consciously trying to facilitate that. It's hard. And how often, if ever, is everyone in one place? Hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, people from HQ travel. Again, we're conscious of this. We're sort of like, San Francisco hasn't had an HQ visitor in a couple weeks, a couple months. Um, but it, we, talk about, we talk about this all the time. The truth about a business like ours is, if everyone leaves Dallas, the W doesn't get their flowers. Um, so, I haven't solved that yet. Can you talk a little bit about your, your culture and if there's a difference between HQ culture and all the, the field offices, yeah. the cultures? I think one interesting thing that happens with the culture um, is that each office gets really tight and really does feel like a tiny startup. Um, we, we went through an exercise at the end of last year of writing down our values. And I feel like I've heard a bunch of startups say this. They're like, when I started and the company was three months old, we were all sitting next to each other and you know, I turned my head and there was one guy and then I turned my head and there was the other guy. And it's the whole company. So you sort of, it's easy to get through osmosis what's important to everyone. Um, once we were in five cities and 80 people, it's harder to just get that through osmosis since we wrote down our values. And what we did to sort of make that process happen was, well, what do we see happening that we like in the company, right? What does the management team embody and act like? And what are the people who are successful here embody and act like? Um, and there are things like, my favorite one is Rhino It. Does anyone know, do you guys know the Rhino Principle? We talk about the Rhino Principle all the time. I have a little toy Rhino on my desk, actually. Um, so the Rhino Principle basically says, it's an article that was in, I think, Forbes. Um, the rhino has no reason to exist today. The rhino should be dead and extinct and no longer around. However, when the rhino confronts a challenge, it charges until the challenge either runs away or is dead. And so that singular focus on eliminating challenges and really like enemies, right, stuff that can take you down, is why the rhino is still alive. And that's like, man, dirty flower water, product that's dying all the time. You got to rhino it. <laughs> so rhinos do well at H Bloom, um, and I think part, a big part of our culture is based upon rhinoing it. Um, and the rest of it is do the right thing, be good people, assume everyone else comes to the table with good intentions, and that you are coming to the table with good intentions. Um, care about the customer, sort of as the very, very first thing we think about. Um, 
because we see all 300 deliveries that are going out at 7 a.m., but they only see one. Um, and so I think that's embedded in our culture is to be thinking about that all the time. Oh, we have a couple. Is there a rigid oversight structure of where they're kind of like managing day to day from the headquarters or regional office or however we've got to organize to make sure that these, I mean, because to make sure they're supposed to do what they're doing, but how do you keep the entrepreneurs? If there is, how do you keep them yeah. the entrepreneurs as opposed to just kind of like sort of forming? Yeah, it's funny. Actually, one of the women who um, left the seed program said something to me when she was sort of when she was around that was man it seems like our new york manager who runs a multi-million dollar business um runs a mcdonald's that's not what entrepreneurship is to me and i was like that's the best compliment you could give the new york manager <laughs> right awesome i want to be running mcdonald's all over the country um so there's so many moving parts and there's so little that's in the playbook so far that it's very much creative problem solving on the fly all the time. Um, and then there are forcing mechanisms that let us understand how people are doing. So every week we do a very arduous calculation that includes things like parking tickets, part-time labor, flower petals that we didn't use, flower food which costs five cents a packet, um, to calculate your gross margin. And then we dig really deep into the line items to understand what you did to make it so. And similarly on the sales side, right, we do the same exercise with revenue. So rigid oversight about how it gets done, not much today. We could probably stand to have a little bit more. Um, but understanding the results, a ton of that. Yes, and every week, every week. Every week. Uh, 36 percent of turnover is a heavy burden. Have you researched? Uh, what are the reasons, major reasons, minor reasons? Why, why do people leave? Yeah, um, I think for some people, it's not the right fit, right? The, sort of what I talked about with people leaving the seed program of, this is what I think a startup is like, this is what it's actually, or this is what our startup is actually like. There's, there's a difference there, and we've refined the recruiting process, many cycles of refining the recruiting process to try false, to make that clear. Yeah, and. We've had tons of conversations about this where sometimes we didn't say the right stuff, sometimes they didn't hear the right stuff. Whatever it was, expectations were misset. Um, a lot of that comes from sales, and I think sales organizations generally have higher turnover, a little bit higher than other parts of the org. Um, sales is a, its own sort of beast, right? And if you're not a fit for sales, you're not a fit for sales. Um, so I think. Those are two. Does that answer your question a little bit? Uh, most of them voluntarily, or you fired people? It's a mix. Most, most of the involuntary turnover happens in sales, right? not meeting your goals, and sort of better use of everyone's time, right? For, for us to help you move on and for you to move on, not good for you to be not meeting your goals. So it's like you said, that some, some amount of churn is desirable. It's good. Yeah, I hate to say that, but sort of necessary, right? Theoretically, we want to get to zero, but I, I can't practically imagine the day where that happens. Well, you're in the flower business. It's like pruning. <laughs> it's a very insensitive sound. <laughs> it's, it, well, you, you said it very well, I think, that it's not a good use of anyone's time, and if you can help them find something that's, that's right. better for them, that's, right. that's important. Sounds like you give a lot of support and nurturing to people on the sales side or the operational managers. What about you know the engineers, the people who make the flower arrangements? What yeah. do you do to make sure they're engaged and that they're improving at their job? Yeah, awesome question. Um, I think we started with the parts of the org that were most measurable and biggest. Um, and some of the things that we're now thinking about are, like, how do we do it with flower designers? Um, I don't know the answer yet. I sort of went through an exercise a couple months ago of like interviewing the flower designers and saying, what is important to you? Um, what would be better for your growth? Some of the answers are to work alongside other flower designers, which, you know, us coming in with the notion of, we're going to give you a salary and benefits and then take back to us. Actually, we would really like to work at a bunch of different places um, sometimes. So, you know, going through the process of talking to all of our employees and trying to understand 
how they, how to engage them. Um, because I've said to Joaquin, our organization is sort of a mutt. Like, we're not just a big software shop. We've got all kinds of different people to whom all kinds of different things are important. Um, so it's going to be different all across the org. I, mean, I apologize for the second question, but it's only because the presentation is so good. You talk about a subscription model. I think about a subscription as consumer 1995. 1995 <laughs> keeps going. I can't imagine the W signs on and, you know, 87,000 and the subscription keeps running. Is it really a subscription model or what's, if you tell us what really is going on here, please. Uh, yeah, so the way that, so it feels like your, maybe your negative subscription experience was. It's not a negative subscription. <laughs> I, I think of, you know, AOL is still making money because people right. are subscribing. Precisely, to precisely. That's all I'm trying to get at. No, no, no. I mean, no, if no you cancel, you cancel, right? I mean, That's right. So you can cancel at any time. We have sort of a light contract, right, where we ask for a certain amount of notice just so that we're able to deliver you the flowers we've already committed to purchasing ourselves. Um, but that's right. Sort of constant interaction with the client, super high touch service. They know we're there. <laughs> what I was getting at before was this is not a situation where you're sort of going to forget that you've subscribed and we're going to keep charging you, it can't happen. Um, and that's actually part of why it works really well for our enterprise clients. Um, hotels, restaurants, law firms, any business that entertains people in its space, clients in its space, generally likes to have flowers, um, or at least there's a bunch of individual proprietors in those categories that like to have flowers to make the space welcoming. And so that's how they purchase. Um, so it was a natural fit. Mom and pop shops do this, they call it weeklies. Um, and I think all we did with the subscription model was just identify a market segment that was already buying this way and aggressively sell into it. Um, consumers, it turns out, don't purchase flowers that way that often. But a bunch of them do. Um, we've got nearly 1,000 subscribers across markets, um, individuals. Once a week to my girlfriend, does it work? It's not. That's, yeah. Checking. That happens. We do a lot of that. Um, but you know, we thought we could capture lots of market share very quickly with both of those models, consumer and B2B. B2B like stuck and grew like a rocket. Consumer, um, we're sort of pivoting a little bit to a facilitating the gift buying experience, right? People like to buy flowers last minute um, and on demand, like once in a while. So we're changing the, the purchasing experience to facilitate that. Is that going to, um, so a big part of your competitive advantage is the logistical excellence that you've created and, and the lack of spoilage. Yeah. Is this ability to, to, uh, to deliver to consumers a little less predictable and therefore going to raise up the, the spoilage rates, I think? So it's a little bit less predictable. Um, so we're doing something different, um, which is, we're creating a mobile shopping, a mobile app. It's a shopping experience where you can purchase all sorts of luxury goods that we've curated in your city. Um, so chocolates, macaroons, cupcakes. Um, we've partnered with vendors who do carry inventory and who do have storefronts and on a regular basis are producing these items. Um, and we're going to facilitate the shopping experience and execute the delivery, which are two of our core competencies, um, but we're not going to sell exclusively flowers. Got it. I was wondering about, uh, you mentioned playbooks are there. Uh, so I think it's great to have like best practices and share them with everyone and make sure that's kind of set in maybe the first week, you know, here's what you need to do to get things going. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, it's, it's not too far of reach that one could say, you know, what works in Chicago doesn't work in Boston. Yeah. So like, how much are you, are you afraid that like or have thought about like playbook might be like stifling some people or, or yeah. maybe they'll find out a better way to do it rather than what you have written down awesome question um so we we're coming up now with the playbook methodology um which is sort of sounds hyper structured as compared to the very little structure we've had before um where a we are hiring people to do discovery and documentation. That is their job. We're calling them process rhinos, which I love. Um, and part of their job, right, is to do the full breadth of discovery. 
across markets and figure out whether you know you can leave an arrangement at the door in Silver Spring, Maryland, because it's a house on a third of an acre. That's fine. You cannot do that on West 10th Street in Manhattan. Someone will take it. Um, and so the process rhino's job is exclusively to find those little intricacies, identify them, document them, um, and then part of the process rhino methodology is we expect you to do maintenance on these processes, right? Go back and audit whether the process is being followed or whether one of the market managers has actually come up with a better solution. Redocument. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I think process rhino might be one of my favorite job titles ever. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for a job? I'm process, process rhino. rhino. <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, looking forward, what are the big challenges that you see? I know that you, you walked in and you said, oh man, I had a, I had a town emergency. Town emergency. <laughs> what are the big challenges that you have uh, the next three months, next year? Yeah. Um, you know, I was saying to someone the other day, it's very counterintuitive, counterintuitive for us to do something like hire a process right now where we identify that there's resource to be had and we allocate the resource to not going faster, right? We allocate the resource to declutching so we can accelerate later. Um, that's just a generally hard thing for us to do. And so there's a lot of sort of conversation and debate about how much resource should we allocate towards, you know, staying the operations and defining and documenting um, and how much towards moving faster. It's a natural push-pull. Um, until until 2013, pushing faster almost always won. Now it's like junior year, um, and we're starting to you know really be an operations company. Um, I think that will continue to be a push pull. It's really interesting to me because I think this is um, this is something that organization development professionals in general struggle with in the startup world, right? So that OD people generally go fairly slowly <laughs> and they're methodical and they like to, to collect data, to analyze the data, yeah. then to talk about the data and then to do something. Uh, whereas it sounds, and well, in my experience in the startup world is, you know, ask forgiveness, not permission. Oh, yes. And uh, so your background here, I think, is serving you really well as opposed to coming from more of a traditional OD background, having, having really a, a different kind of background and this impetus to, to move faster. Is that right? It's funny, I'm, try I'm trying to hire a recruiter right now, so if anyone knows anyone who wants to be my recruiter, our recruiter, send them over. Um, and people with recruiting backgrounds apply, and people with HR backgrounds apply. And I'm looking for people with sales backgrounds. I'm like, have you managed a pipeline? Have you done closes, right? Have you pitched successfully? Um, so we look at talent differently from the way we look at HR. Talent as separate from HR. So it's really, you're, you're selling people on H. Bloom and the opportunities there. Always be selling. Always be selling. <laughs> closing, always be closing. It sounds like you're filtering, you know, some failure. Let's say Jack Welsh walked in the room and said, hi, I want to be part of the C program. Is he going to get filtered out right away? Is Jack Welsh might be too expensive for the C program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he might say, well, I'm free or whatever. He might. You've already made a prejudgment yeah. because he's older and he's more expensive, right? So are you automatically saying that I'm going after the, the young graduates because they're cheap, or because they're malleable, or because you just don't believe entrepreneurs, you know, all the entrepreneur kind of an oxymoron doesn't work for you? Yeah, I think that it's it was the process of doing tons of sort of interview discovery, right? Every time we raise a new role, we do a bunch of interviewing of people, you know, ultimately don't end up fitting our profile and then we refine the profile. Um, for seed, a couple of things tend to make people with less experience better fits, including um, the fact that you got to move. Today we ask people to commit to moving somewhere that we haven't told them about yet at an undetermined date. Um, and folks that are further along in life, like that's often a, a big deal breaker. I think in the future we'll be able to map out where we're going to go, right, and set an expectation much more clearly. But today, we don't know yet. Um, the prospect of 
gaining entrepreneurial experience through lugging the flower water, right? These two folks that, that ended up going away were both people with tons more experience. Um, and they got in and they were like, this is really uncomfortable as compared to what I was doing before um, for the past six years. And so the prospect of sort of getting your hands really, really dirty and doing all the dirty work in order to get the entrepreneurial experience is more attractive to younger folks with less experience. Um, it's what we found through the interview process. Now, we just hired a seed with an MBA. Um, was in the Peace Corps, she was a teacher, she worked for a nonprofit, she's doing awesome. Um, and so, certainly. The more of the exception. Yeah, I mean, today, today our seed grads generally have less experience than her. Um, but. So maybe a telling question is, you have two co-founders. If they came into the seed program, would you hire them? Uh, yeah, I would. The way that we sell seed is often, this is how the company started. Like what you will do when, a, when, you, when you open a market is what our co-founders did when they started the company, which was, we think we can sell flowers. We're going to try to sell them ourselves. We sold some flowers. We don't know how to deliver flowers. We're going to deliver them ourselves. Um, so that's, that continues to be the process of opening a market. And that's what they did. So. so. Two, two more questions. Sure. Other questions from the audience? Yeah. What do you say that it's your profitability that gives you the luxuries around these programs? No. <laughs> um, we do all this stuff really leanly. So I'm department of one, soon to be two, if you know a recruiter. Um, and we don't spend very much money on infrastructure stuff to, to run these programs. Um, the software I was talking about costs under $1,000 a year. And I've looked long and hard for software that was in that bucket. Um, this stuff doesn't cost much money. We, we concentrate on it and we give time. Um, but I would say no. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking more of the cost of man hours. You know, so like yeah. my company, I feel like everyone's too busy to you know, have a workshop for us to develop our skills. Yeah, I mean, our, our thesis there is just at work, you don't practice enough. Like, you go to school, and you're on teams, and all you do all day is practice, and once in a while, you have a game or a test during which you put your practice to work. At work, you start, and you don't practice at all, and the whole, the whole engagement is the game. Um, so we fundamentally believe that if we give people more practice, they're going to do better um, and sort of want Google people ops like metrics around that, but we think that that's just true. So um, that said, when when should a startup start thinking about a leadership development program? It's a good question. I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that question. <laughs> we started really young um, for the dual purpose of entrepreneurship is 